Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Cold and fun. That's good that you think that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving. And I'm like, ooh, there's some deer moving. All of a sudden, I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's When you're the 275 pounds, I don't know how you do that, but. The Freightliner? <laughs> It's just like a creeper. He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah. You know? He's like, you know, he's up there slapping it, pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. How did you say his name? Her- Herve Velichos. <laughs> you know what Pertnier means? If you know what Pertnier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast, brought to you by Pertnier Outdoors. It's that time of year. It's that time of year where we all need to be thinking about, do we have everything we need to hit the woods? Chances are you don't, and if you think you do, you probably could use some more. So how about you go over to thehuntworks.com and check out all the incredible products these guys are carrying. Uh, This is a great family, local store. Uh, Dan and Steve Dunnigan, a couple hardworking some bitches. They are now carrying archery equipment, everything from bows to arrows to broadheads, quivers, you name it. So on top of all the great tree stands and box blinds that they're carrying, they're now a full full on archery dealer. And really recommend that you check these guys out for your next big purchase. Uh, head over to thehuntworks.com to see what they've got for sale. Or if you're local in the Rochester area, head on over to their store in East Rochester on Despatch Drive and check them out. They are on social media, The Hunt Works, and also online, like I said. And if you purchase anything online, you can use promo code FEEDNEM to get 5% off. And that's F-E-E-D, FEEDN, I-N-U-M, 5% off. FEEDNEM. It's working. Are we working? There you go. Hey, technology. Let me back up here. Okay. This freaking pisses. You know what? I, I I've been wanting to do this through my podcast recorder, but it doesn't seem to want to work. Yeah. So this is going off. Screw it. It's just me and you. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just gonna get this this, this stuff right out of the way. Jim, how are you? Doing good, man. I'm tired. <clears throat> it's been a, it was a long weekend. I'm still recovering. I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> how you doing, buddy? How was your weekend? My weekend was full. I had I had uh well last week, as you know, my, my grandmother passed away, the matriarch of the Harvey family. So we spent a good portion of last week uh, you know, kind of mourning that situation Wednesday, Thursday. And then Friday I uh found myself heading up to camp midday meeting up with the family and uh on a friday afternoon we stayed up way too late having a good time with everybody at camp around the dinner table on friday and then we hunted uh hunted hard on saturday had a good day in the woods had one harvey put a buck down cousin dave so that was pretty cool maybe if dave tunes in here maybe we can grab him and have him tell his story but um he shot the old new york 11 pointer Nice little spot here. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So we had that and then was up late again on Saturday night. And then Sunday night, Sunday came home, was home at 7 a.m. Right as the kids are waking up, wife was super happy, took care of that situation. And then we went to the Bills game Sunday night. So it's been a, it's been a whirlwind. It oh, sounds, and then, sounds quite like, like quite the roller coaster. Yeah. And then on top of that, we had a mass spreader event at the cabin or at, uh, or at the funeral services, who knows? But most of the Harvey family has COVID right now. So. Are you kidding? Yeah. Wow. Not, not me, because you know yeah. I don't I don't jam tampons up my nose, so I don't know if. I have it or not. <laughs> yeah, you might still have the antibodies from the last time. Maybe I don't know how that works. But. Yeah, you never know. 
So yeah, that was the rundown of my weekend. I, I slept in this morning to yep. six o'clock. I felt pretty good about myself. Yep. We're back on track. That's great. Yeah, I've been waking up. Typically, uh, I, when I stay, at, I stay at my dad's uh, little cabin up, you know, where I hunt. And uh, typically, every morning the alarm goes off about three a.m. So we can make coffee, get dressed. Uh, you know, we have to drive a little bit still to get where to where we're going to hike in, and then hike in. Uh, and the hike in is typically around forty to forty-five minutes, just like kind of going easy. If I really wanted to, like, hoof it, I could probably make it like thirty. Um, yeah. But I don't. I try not I try to keep from sweating and stuff, you know. And uh, so yeah, I've been waking up early every day, and uh, so I'm still recovering from that. Not to mention, I you know I've been doing ten, twelve hour sits all days. You know, if I'm, I look at it like if I'm gonna if if I'm making the time and I have the time to go out, I'm gonna just hit it hard all day long. Um, I know yeah. this time of year it might it might be a little iffy. You know, you should really kind of just try to hit your hit a morning or an afternoon or both. And kind of give yourself a break, but I'm already, I'm already out there a good way. So I figured, you know, why not sit all day? And, and, uh, to much of my surprise, I'll, most of the movement that I actually seen this whole weekend was between 10 and two. So, uh, I don't know if that helps anybody or not, but. That's but, interesting. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we were seeing movement, um, like Friday was Friday. Well, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night sits like we had between our, personal friends our buddy greg shot a slammer over at the farm we hunt and have on um ben williams and his crew all three of him his dad and his buddy nate all shot nice mature bucks on i believe it was thursday night friday night saturday night mm -hmm. um so like the evenings have been really really good but the mornings um and now we've got all these trail cameras on throughout our properties the mornings the mornings have been still been tough because the deer are on the food sources still at like you know six o'clock five thirty six o'clock so like we're trying to go in to our stands mm -hmm. and we're bump we're bumping deer so actually the the best movement we were seeing in the mornings uh especially saturday morning was the, really the only morning we had a bunch of guys in the woods was like at eight to nine o'clock hour um my cousin david shot his buck at at uh at like 8 20 8 30 was somewhere right around there when david shot his mm -hmm. and um so it's funny because you kind of start getting discouraged you get to like 8 8 30 9 o'clock and like things are quiet you haven't seen anything and you're like you're like well man i should just get down out of the stand and you know go move stands or go back to the cabin or whatever but yeah. it, it never it never fails that that like mid to late morning movement it always happens this time of year now last weekend all the activity was between like first light, like gray light, I would say like right at seven o'clock, six forty-five, seven o'clock, uh, till about uh, ten thirty was probably about the latest that I seen movement. And then anything after that, it was just like straight dead. Specifically the afternoon. The afternoon sits were painful. Not only were the <laughs> bugs bad where I was, like the the little gnat flies, because I think the temperatures are just way too high for this time of year. Um, yeah. But I was I was I couldn't even stay still because I'm busy trying to swap flies. I didn't want to wear bug spray for scent control. Yeah, I just really, I was really having a hard time. So um, the afternoon sits were miserable. But um, and as luck would have it, both uh, this past weekend and the weekend prior. Uh, so at the weekend prior on Sunday, when I was on my way home, I had movement like right past my stand first thing in the morning. Uh, one of the one of the two target bucks. I call it target bucks. It's, it's the mountains. I mean, anything could possibly happen, but. I have two bucks that uh, that I'm hunting, like what I believe to be their core areas, and one of those guys showed up uh, Sunday morning. So right after I'm I'm gone, he's there, and the same thing coincidentally happened um, Monday. I had to, I took off Monday, and I could only hunt till about one o'clock, and I got down out of the stand uh, a little bit like twelve thirty, hiked my way back out. I got to the truck at like one fifteen, and um, I had you know then checked my phone and at one o six. He had come by my stand so i had literally missed him by you know maybe 30 minutes that's frustrating which was, which was super frustrating this has been a crazy season i think i honestly think the weather has been played a major factor this is the warmest rut uh i've ever experienced and i, I don't even know if i'm even gonna 
I'll go out. I, I can't go out this week during a week because of work, but even this weekend, I, I might just call it and just push it another. I'm not going to, I don't want to burn myself out. I feel like that's what I've been doing. No. You know? no. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at this weekend. I don't know about down in, in your region of Pennsylvania, but we're looking at mid seventies, both Saturday and Sunday. And I mean, I'm in a beautiful situation because I'm, I've got my buck tag filled. I have zero, zero, zero stress. I have mm-hmm. none. Yeah. Like, not an ounce. Like I was up at camp like, Oh, uncle Mike, do you want to move tree stands for three hours? Mm -hmm. I'm your guy. You know, it's like the greatest feeling ever. But if I'm you or anybody else out there, it's like sitting on a buck tag. I wouldn't be burning my spots. I wouldn't be burning my situation with my house and my wife and my kids. Like go do some fun stuff with your family (laughs) this weekend. Don't, you know, maybe go hunt the last hour and a half, two hours of light or something, you know, cause they're going to move in the evening. I, that's the one thing I'll say, like driving around the last couple afternoons, it's been warm. And in the morning on the way to work, I'm not seeing any deer anywhere out in fields. Mm-hmm. Um, and yesterday evening in particular, it was like 65 degrees. And at four o'clock, there was deer just crawling around the fields. I, especially closer I got to home, the more deer I was seeing out in fields. So, and that was reflected that the cameras, the trail cams were really busy last night, like starting right around five thirty, six o'clock, all the way through until about 10, 30, 11. And then, you know, that's just what's happening in front of the cameras, but things died down quite a bit, but I don't know. We're starting to see, uh, I just posted a couple pictures in our story from tonight, uh, starting to see some single fawns by themselves. So, you know, that's a sign that the does are, you know, they may not be in heat, but they're getting close and they're, you know, breaking away. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I just wouldn't kill yourself this weekend. Yeah, I did. I did see a fair amount of red activity the last two weekends. Um, very little on the previous weekend, but I did have a buck chase, a small buck, a four pointer chasing a doe. Uh, we had nose to the ground, all, all the signs, you know, he, he wasn't really running her hard, like, you know, but he was, he was tailing her close. Uh, this past weekend I had, uh, I had a legal eight point. He was a little bit smaller than what I've, what I've been kind of targeting, but, uh, to be honest, I, I, um, I had all intentions of shooting him. He got my heart racing. So he had been, he flew past my tree like three times, uh, like really dogging a doe hard. And to the point where like I whistled and would like even yelled at him at full draw and he would not stop. I could yeah. not, you know, break him off or I tried grunting, uh, like again, whistling. It just, you know, it was, it, it's neat to be in the woods for those, for those encounters. Um, so yeah, no, I obviously didn't have luck there, but it's it's exciting, and I'm starting to learn more. Maybe as I get older here, or I put more more time in. Is that you know, there's a lot more to, to hunting and hunting the rut than just you know, uh, bagging a bagging a nice buck. It's like I'm really starting to appreciate what the the sights and sounds of of the rut time and this time in, in archery season. You know, both from the deer, but the other critters that are out there and the change it's amazing from weekend to weekend how different the woods looks already Mm -hmm. and uh it's it's been neat so looking forward to getting out again but like you said i'm not going to burn myself out i think i'm going to take this weekend off even though a lot of people are probably like what the hell are you doing you know this isn't the first week in november this is supposed to be like the the week you know Um, now is this weekend you can hunt both saturday and sunday this weekend or is that next, next weekend that's next weekend, yeah. Next yeah. weekend, the thirteenth, I believe, is a Sunday. That, that's the sun first Sunday we can hunt. Yeah, like I, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm saying that about not going out this weekend, and it's like, you know, but then it gets it gets more difficult. You know, like this is, I guess, probably the weekend. You know, it's right around the seventh, eighth, ninth. You're getting into that period of time where you know they're not in lockdown, but they're really seeking hard. Or if you find it and you find where it's happening, it's going down, mm-hmm. but you know, then you get into the weekend of the 13th, 14th, 12th, 13, 14, like you're getting into lockdown, you know, the, the woods are very quiet unless you're right there where it's happening. And especially if it's loud and noisy, like it's very difficult to get in on, on the action where, you know, it's been wicked dry here. I don't know about you guys, but like the woods is so freaking loud right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everything is dry. So like you can't even kind of creep around and try to like, you know, find fresh sign and set up on it. Um, or, you know, look for, you know, finding a doe that's a doe or a buck that are standing in the woods and you can get into the middle of the action. Like it's very difficult to do that right now. Mm-hmm. It's so loud in there. So I mean, the best we had our success this weekend 
and Jimmy sat the same stand, I believe Fridays, Friday night sit, saw, saw the buck that he put, put the video up of, which is a beautiful buck. Mm -hmm. um, he passed him and then saw a bigger buck after. So that, you know, could have potentially panned out. But then the following night, the following morning, he sat there, saw deer. And then again, um, that evening, and we, I sat with him that night, we did a double set and, um, we got to see, we had saw seven deer, um, two, two bucks came down off the side hill, pushing a doe fighting, but like it's starting the setup, I think is kind of important as to where he was having success. And he's on the, he's right at the base of a hill, um, of a sharp, very steep side hill, which is where the majority of our bedding is. Mm -hmm. So I guess you could play this out. You could play this out in flatland too, but in hill country, you know, this scenario plays out a lot where the deer will bet on the side hills mm -hmm. and, so the deer are all moving up on the side hill in the morning. And if you don't booger them up and get them out of there, that's where they are. And then they mm -hmm. want to start working their way back down to the food sources at night and the thermals are dropping. So like we're on the leeward side of the hill mm -hmm. and the sun is, the sun is over the hill at like two o'clock, like one thirty, two o'clock. Like it's already, the temperatures are already starting to drop by mid afternoon. Right. The sun's gone. So the thermals are already pulling down yep. and, that's where I think Jimmy's having his success with that spot is because he's, he's got food below him. He's in the tra transition zone and the mm -hmm. deer are already above him, So they're not going to bust him wind wise. And the deer have been sitting up there all day. So they feel comfortable coming down as long as they can see everything, which they can from above. Mm -hmm. And he's finding himself like right in that buffer zone. So it's, it's a, uh, I love like the scenario of having a landscape where you have those obvious topographical features it's mm -hmm. super hard in farmland to like have those obvious transition features and you know unless you've got you know ag field and a brush lot like it's fairly obvious like where the deer are and where they're going to go sure. but you still don't know exactly how they're going to get there um and you don't always have those thermals to, to work in your favor the thermals are just huge when you're up there mm -hmm. in the hills so well speaking of that you know i just had this conversation with jeremy and uh I had a heck of a time. Every app that I had was dead wrong th these last two weekends. You know, they would call it and I would set based off of what they were telling me. And then I get there and it's something different. So then I tr changed my game plan, like on the fly in the dark, you know, and, and set up according to the wind. And within an hour or two, it's changing again. You know, the swirling winds in those, in that, that hill country is unbelievable. And, and what's wild is a lot of the movements, particularly the buck movement was not, in favor of the wind direction they were like right. it's odd behavior um now there was a couple of the more mature bucks uh that i seen that so I, to, to paint the picture i'm hunting doe bedding uh what, what's been historically known as doe bedding so some guys ask me like you know how do you know that's for sure doe bedding is that like a guarantee that does are going to bed there no it's not a guarantee but it has all the telltale signs and i know from historical data both with trail cameras and encounters that that is 100 percent a doe bedding area so I'm hunting, uh, hunting that transition point of thick, thick laurel on a hillside. There's a creek bottom just below them. And if you go to the just a, a little bit higher on the hillside, um, there's a, a nice flat with a giant patch of white oaks. I had a healthy acorn drop this year, and it's a, a, a very open hardwood area. And uh, I'll send you a picture later so you can get a better idea. But it's an it's a unbelievable um, transition point from two totally opposite terrain features. It's like it's literally like, you know, if, if you were to paint a picture and draw a line straight down the middle of the picture, that's exactly what it looks like. It's super neat to sit there. Um, and some, and a lot of the mature bucks come around and they'll, they'll skirt that, that thick patch and they'll stay right on the edge. Um, and they'll, and they'll browse a little bit in the, uh, in the acorns. And as they're doing that, you could catch them nosing and catching the, the wind coming off and they're scent checking that doe bedding. And it's super neat to watch them do that. Um, so trying to, play those tra that transition points as to where they're going to send check and not get winded yourself has been quite the chess match, but um, I've been enjoying every minute of it. And I'm excited to get back out there. I'm excited. That's honestly, right. I wish I had, I wish I had a rifle in my hand um, because I would be boots on the ground and I'd be making those switches every time that the wind would change. And I have, I would have a way better opportunity. I think of getting a, a mature buck out there. Would, would you be better off like waiting until the sun has come up and, you know, you know, eight thirty, eight eight thirty, and let the let the thermals in the air start kind of moving and giving you an idea before you try to get into position. I guess, yeah, I guess that's a that's a good point. 
I just didn't see any uh, much consistency in the wind. And I never, I, I never seem to when I hunt, hunt, hunt that type of terrain. The consistency no. in the wind is just not there. So I guess I just try to, I don't know, I get, I'm antsy in the morning, so I'm just like raring to like get set up, you know, and I'm kind of the guy, yeah. like I said, once I get set up, I, I prefer to sit all day if I can just, you know, my grandfather always said that uh, the best camo and the best place or the best camouflage you could have is to sit and be quiet. And uh, so I, I try to play off that and do that. But um, I, with a mobile setup, I suppose I, I, I could, I could just set up temporarily wait for gray light to pass. And then, like you said, make a move, maybe. I'll well, try you, could, I mean, you could even just set up on the group. You don't even have to set up. Just, you know, get to a point where a vantage point where you want to sit and listen and, you know, watch. Mm -hmm. And then when, once you get a good bearing on what the wind is doing, because, I mean, we deal with exactly the same thing. The only time that we get consistent wind at camp during the day, just wind, not talking thermals, just wind, is mm -hmm. if we have a north wind or a south wind because of the orientation of the hill we're on. Mm -hmm. The hill runs north and south, so that's the only, really the only, and most of our winds in this area are west and southwest, mm -hmm. and all that does is just creates just swirls and vortexes in the, in that area. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, we're going to go, we're going to move locations. My wife just jumped in the shower. <laughs> We're going to go on the bathroom. Just kidding. Where'd you go? Oh, are we back? Where'd you go? I'm here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, about I that. just. No, you're good. I just sent you a picture, too, uh, that I took out of the stand of that transition. It's just, it's, uh, it'll help. Mm -hmm. It'll help the conversation when you can see kind of like what, what we're looking at. But I think it's very similar to, well, together. Um, Me too, because I just opened that up and it popped up. Oh, did it? Okay. All right. Um, well, any, anyhow. But yeah, I think, I think that's something you, that you got to look at and think about is when's it worth going in there. And I think that's one of the challenges that we – deal with so much on our property is that we want to hunt the mornings because we're there mm -hmm. we want to go hunt the mornings but so often we're almost better off waiting until the sun comes up to sneak into our spots or the other thing that we did this weekend which we used to do all the time and we're kind of joking about getting back in the middle of, back into a routine of doing it is actually having whoever is going to be driving like my uncle mike likes to hunt the top of the hill is have Uncle Mike drive the top, you know, drive across the property with the four wheeler with a couple guys on it and drop mm -hmm. them off and then just keep driving. Um, and so like, just for example, Friday night, we had, we had Jeff all on the same level of our property. Our property's on a side hill and there's like two benches um, that are very defined where all of our food plots are on the benches, but right before the hill goes up steep mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we had Jeff, Jimmy, my dad, Uncle Chris, and Dave. So five guys in a line across the property. We had mm -hmm. the whole property covered from north to south. And my Uncle Mike drove the, my brother side by side and dropped off everybody as he headed across the property. He dropped them off. They went and jumped in their stands. And everyone saw bucks. We had an incredible night. The movement was obviously good but the deer were not boogered at all with having the four wheeler go through the property. Cause we drive four wheelers through the property all year round. Uncle Mike is up there cutting firewood and doing work. Mm -hmm. So he just went on, went on about his way, dropped them off, kept going and went and hunted the evening. And when he came back, picked everybody up, any deer that were in the food plots, bumped them off with the four wheeler, no harm, no foul. They were right back out there all night long, you know, showing on the trail camera. So, you know, I think a lot of it is just, figuring out how you can access your stuff without boogering them too bad it's tough and, every every morning i went in i was bumping deer um i had yeah. deer i had deer under me in the dark when i can't see you know every morning um it, it's just a, the area is hot in the morning and yeah. that's why it's tough not to go you know i guess if i you know I, if even if i wait later in the day i suppose i still risk bumping deer but at that point i might be able to make a more accurate uh set up on wind you know once the thermal is yeah. clear so, yeah and 
but you know, you know that some days the deer are back in there earlier than others. If it's a bedding area, mm-hmm. you know, they, if they're out feeding at three o'clock in the afternoon, the day before, they're going to be heading back to bed earlier. But if they don't get out to really start feeding until, you know, eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock at night, then mm-hmm. they may not make it back. That's one of the things like I, I like to start looking at is the, the moon rise and moon set. And I've really found those to be pretty accurate in depicting when the deer are going to move early and late, you know, or, or if the moon is a, is it, well, the moon rise, moon set, the underfoot uh, overhead, like it's fascinating. If you start paying attention to those things, you can go on Google and just search, you know, moonrise calendar, mm-hmm. and you can you can look at the actual times of when this when the moon is rising and setting, mm-hmm. or when it's overhead or underfoot. And like the overhead underfoot is pretty crazy. Like it it does. If you got a day when it's like a, a nice fall day, and the moon is the moon might be out at like two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. There's a good chance if you drive around, you're paying attention. There's going to be deer out in fields feeding. It's kind of right. wild. Right. So. Yeah. I've, I've been paying, I've been really trying to pay attention as to when uh, they, they head out of bed and when they go to bed. I, so there's, there's a cluster of trails that obviously that cut through this main bedding area. Um, and I have in all, in all the main trails that are heavily beaten. They, I mean, they, they're like to the mud. It's like dirt bike paths. It's amazing. I have uh, cell cameras in every single one of those, both on, on the upper hill side and the lower side uh, to kind of see, what travels through there and when, and, and like I said, when things are going to bed and, and when, when they're leaving. So I've been trying to keep a little chart of like data for when that's happening, but it's been, it's been way more sporadic than, than consistent over the, it's from what the data has showed me in years past. And I, I really think that's weather related. Um, yeah. So the cold fronts were the most consistent. So quote unquote cold fronts, like the two or three day cold spells that we had here uh, throughout mid October have been you know that's when my cameras were consistent with the bedding so yeah yeah my god cold fronts are the king the king man Mm -hmm. i mean it's so interesting because we've all kind of been on the same track of you know like i feel like we have learned so much about deer movement and deer hunting you know beyond the stuff that we learned from our old men Mm -hmm. and uh and it's like cold fronts is it like if you can just sit there and watch the forecast and you can time that right like everyone who watched the weather this weekend and saw we had that cold front wednesday night and it rained wednesday night here pretty heavy through thursday and then thursday the weather broke and it was cold it was it was clear it was crisp the pressure was rising like wednesday night was good thursday night was good friday night was good Mm -hmm. it was if you were around that cold front, you were having, if not encounters, you were having success. So, yep. I mean, that's the, and, and that, that kind of carries on throughout the deer season. You know, mm-hmm. if you've got the cold front, just cause the rut is over, doesn't mean that the deer aren't going to, you know, use that to get them back on their feet and out and feeding and being active and visible. I, I think the gun season this year for Pennsylvania is going to be a slaughter. That's just my early prediction. Uh, just based on, I think the rut is going to push later, a lot later than normal due to the weather. Um, and aside from that, I, I think we're due for a real, real hard cold spell. And I think that's going to hit, you know, based off of, you know, what, what the uh, forecast are showing me when you look at like the 30 day and 60 day forecast, it's, it's showing that that's going to hit right around our, our gun opener, which is the, you know, right after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So, yeah. Um, see, I, is it that the rut's going to be pushed back or that all the does aren't going to get bred because just because it's like, I always want, I always, I'm always interested in that. Like it seems like here with our properties that we're focusing on, mm-hmm. the rut happens the same, you know, the, the chasing, the, the phases, they happen the same every year. Mm-hmm. That's just what it seems like. And we've really, we've actually been talking a lot about it this just recently is that it seems like we have not had really a good, good rutting activity here on on our farm in wyoming county we have not had a good like visible rut in like several years and we're kind of starting to put the pieces together that we think our buck to doe ratio might be off um we've got we have peers that we have way more bucks than we do does and uh both by you know what i experienced that night when i saw 10 bucks and not a single doe and you know we'll get a few does on camera but there isn't the you know, 10, 14, 20 doe groups that you see in a lot of ag land. Like 
Trigger's not, not really we, helping that cause, you know. She's listen, Trigger is doing <laughs> business in areas <laughs> all those deer have been shot on other pieces of property. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. He we would he would hear about that if uh <laughs> Dallas would have him against the woodshed by the neck. <laughs> yeah. So you listen here, you little shit, quit shooting all my deer. Yeah. But uh, but I think I, I think that's some something that's going on too. Like I think we've got too many bucks and not enough does and like these big mature bucks like they're not having to work that hard to get a doe to breed that what you just said is key i think in the like the terrain that you guys are hunting there in the farms i think the deer don't have to work as hard to get the things that they need whereas like in the hill country why i think in my opinion i think the rut's going to push is because you know uh does have to travel more for their food sources especially like, you know, if they hit these little pockets of white oaks or red oaks or what have you, and it gets eaten up and dried up per se, they got to move on to the next one. And they're kind of spreading out a little bit more than they would, I, I, in my opinion, anyway, on in some of this ag country where it kind of can hold them into these pockets. So in, there, in that, you know, regard, all these bucks kind of tr- got to travel out of their core areas a little bit more to try to, fun- to, try to corral these does. Um, and I just think it's a little bit tougher. And in in, in that not for uh, not not necessarily for the hunter, but it's tougher for the deer to kind of breed in a more consistent basis. Yeah, no, I, I don't think you're wrong. I, it's definitely a different, and I think that's partially why we see the every year when we're down there for a rifle hunt, like mm-hmm. in the you know f- right around the first through the fifth, the, in that window there, um, we always seem to come across a hot doe or two. Mm-hmm. Because I, I really think there's a lot of deer that don't get bred in that first round. And it just kind of trickles the rut along. And mm-hmm. you have that second wave of does coming in that didn't get bred the first time. Yep. So. And you have you have in Pennsylvania now, which is insane, you have these different youth seasons and bear seasons with the muzzleloader uh, all during the archery time. Uh, you got squirrel hunters and whatnot during the archery season. It's uh, there's a lot of human pressures in these in the, the that those areas as well that is kind of pushing the deer around where then they have to kind of renavigate to find these does again to get get them bred. So yeah, it's just yeah, I think that's the biggest factor. You know, I agree. So we kind of talked about your game plan, what you got. You're gonna play the weekend by year and see what happens, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so what else we got going on? I think that's kind of a, well, you hold on. Your dad shot a buck. Yeah. My, so. dad, my dad. Yeah. So <laughs> back to our, our folks. Yeah. It, he's old school. He, he will sit dark to dark in the same tree, you know, for the most part every year, he's got a archery area and he's got a gun area and that's what he does. And he loves it. Yeah. So I can't fault him for that, but he is the most patient hunter uh, I've ever known. He will, he, he can out sit anybody in my opinion. But uh, so he did just that. And, um, you know, it, to his, to the, his prevail. It's funny because I actually, uh, that, that buck, the previous weekend, I actually filmed that buck. I passed him up. He was a small seven point and, uh, my dad actually, it took him. So it was like neat to have an encounter with that buck and to have my dad, uh, more than happy to put his tag on it. And it was just kind of neat that we both kind of had a little encounter with the same deer. Um, which in that kind of, that, those areas and us being so far away, apart from one another, um, is, is pretty, pretty is pretty, is pretty rare. Yeah. We weren't miles apart. You know, we were, I would say like 900 to a thousand yards, I would say somewhere in that vicinity separated. Um, yeah. so uh, that's not, you know, a deer could cover that in minutes. Um, so it's, it's nothing for that to happen, but to, to us to see the same deer and to have a, a shot at it was pretty cool. That is neat. We had a, talking about distances, we had a, our neighbor up there in Naples, uh, one of the boys shot a buck, a nice 10 pointer on Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we ended up connecting them. They were having a tough time finding it. The deer, they bumped it and it, it got a second, uh, second wind. And so they, they backed off and, um, we called a deer tracker, the guy that I've met through the podcast and, and just being out and about. Um, Phil Huber, he lives in Bear Mountain Tracking, I think is the name of his company. And uh, he's over just kind of as a crow flies. It's not really that far from our camp, but it's it's pretty good haul. And there's a lot of train between. 
Mm-hmm. But he's got a nice piece of property and he's got food plots and he manages everything and sees a deer. And and so this buck that the boys shot, uh, that 10 pointer, he has trail cam pictures from uh, two days before oh, at no his way. house, which is, you know, but from dot to dot from his house to where the buck was shot physically, the first hit on the deer was like 2.1 miles. Um, and there's not an easy way to get there. It's not like the deer is just like walking in a ag bottom, you know, it's mm-hmm. over, over a mountain, over a couple mountains and, you know, crossing roads and it's pretty wild. So like you start wild. to get an idea like how far these deer are going and like, I'm showing him this guy trail cam pictures of stuff that we're getting and like, he's getting it over at his house too. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. so it's like, no wonder you go days without seeing deer because they're doing a freaking, you know, you hear people talk about it, but like, to me, my dad and I were talking about this, like in Pennsylvania, the mountains are so big. There's no, there's roadless areas. Like it's not hard to comprehend that a deer could go from like here to there and cover all that ground. Mm-hmm. But like when you get into an area, like where our camp is, like you've got, you know, main roads and all the bottoms, you've got cabins and houses and <laughs> they know, have to have a lot of ambition to get there. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So like these deer are just like, whatever, like I'm going to go on a, you know, a five mile roundabout just to go check and see if that scrape is hot over there. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's incredible. It really is. Yeah. So turn uh, neat, neat animal. Yeah. So, so Jim, it's a, uh, it is November 1st, which means we're one month away I know. from the Pennsylvania big mountain whacking, stacking, weed whacking adventure. That, that has been the reason also why I, I've, I've let some bucks walk, which in years, I mean, I'm not, I'm not bashful at all. If it's a, a good Pennsylvania eight point, you know, it just even with the years are just outside the years is I have a pile of them, hundred inch deer. I will be more than happy to shoot them, but, you guys have taught me to be a little bit more patient so that way I have a chance at some bigger, bigger stuff based off of what I've seen in all the garages when I did my tour. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but also it helps me uh, because, you know, I want to, I'd like to keep my tag and be in the game uh, when I come up to camp with you guys. But if I am lucky enough to tag something, I'm coming regardless because I can't wait to pull, help uh, push deer into people, but it's going to be a blast. It's, it's definitely my favorite hunt of the year for sure. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. And I, I hope we get that cold weather because the last couple of years we haven't had snow and it's really such a – well, we had snow the first had, day last year. Yeah, we had like a dusting, I remember, on that yeah. that Thursday when we pulled in there. Yeah, definitely a game changer. So mm-hmm. um, what uh, – you had, you had things you wanted to talk about. I mean, dude, do you prefer to have Dallas here or am I not uh, resourceful <laughs> enough to have this Dal- Well – I mean, yeah, I mean, sure, we could talk about some. I, I, I prefer Dallas, yeah, but it's not no, – no dig at you. You know, it's just uh, Dallas has uh, a lot of experience hunting the same types of terrain that I am. And you got, you got some experience, too. I'm not trying to knock you. But Dallas has been around the block a little bit. So I just kind of – I was racking my brain off of a bunch of trail camera data earlier on in the year, trying to figure out how I should set up and where I might be able to set up or change things up. Um, you know, looking at, you know, like I said, that transition point with the doe bedding, um, I have a pretty good idea where I think bucks are bedding both on either side of that, on you know, different ends of, of the hill. Um, but I, I'm not sure if I should, when, I'm not sure when I should be aggressive and get into the buck bedding or if I should hunt the doe bedding. You know, I'm just, there's so many questions to be asked. And if I had a gun, I would hunt everything because I love to still hunt. That's my favorite, you know? Yeah. Right. So that's, but Good. archery is a different game. Dude, it's so hard. And in these areas of terrain and, you know, loud approaches and everything, like it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. I, on on Friday, um, before I went to camp on my way down there, I stopped at some, at my favorite piece of public and did some, some scouting. Cause I haven't been there at all and uh, walked around and I found, so I only saw in my, you know, two and a half, three hour walk I did, I only saw one deer. I only bumped one deer that I know of because I, I saw it get up and out of its bed. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, I found um, I, the leaves of all, like ton of leaves dropped last week. So I found a bed like right on, on a point, right in a spot that would make perfect sense for a deer to lay down a buck 
Um, there was a single bed by itself. Um, I don't think this would be like a bed where that deer was using it consistently, but it's a good spot for him to plop down and take a rest. Um, and I, I find this quite often in some of these big um, hardwood hilly areas where they're not always looking to bed in the thickest area in the, mm -hmm. in the most, you know, secluded spot. Like they want to lay in a spot where they can see, they can smell, they can hear, and they can get out of dodge like real quick by jumping off of a, um, off of a ledge or over mm -hmm. a, over a crest of a hill or something. And so this bed was laying right there and I was like, huh, noted. And then I went to looping up through another spot and there's a couple of these like knobs and that, are they they look over each other and it's like this long um finger that comes down but each one of like maybe every 150 150 200 yards there's another knob and it kind of like steps up the hill mm -hmm. and um and each one of those knobs is fairly thick it's got some beach brush it's got some cover and i've been hunting this area for for four years now like there's oh there's very consistently beds you go in there when there's snow on the ground like you can see the sign so the deer use that and it was like right on, right on cue. I was, it was, it was so loud walking. I was like, I'm not going to be able to sneak up into here and mm -hmm. see anything. I don't really want to booger this area up too much because I do want to sit here for the evening. So I ended up, I was like halfway across this, this bench and I, and then coming up on the next knob or little point knob, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and I could see some buck rubs and stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to back, I'm going to back out of here. I'm going to drop down the hill. The thermals were starting to pull down the hill at that point. So I was like, I'll just get down. My wind will be in my favor. I'll kind of get out of here and then I'll sneak up the middle of the property and get set up for the evening below the bedding area for where I know the doe's bed. And, um, it dude, as soon as I turned my head to turn and go back down the hill, that point that I was walking towards a, mm -hmm. a, a single deer jumped up and just, dropped right over the edge, like never snorted, didn't make a lot of, a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. But I, as soon as I turned my head, that deer was up and over the edge and gone. And most I was likely, like, most likely a mature buck. I mean, he's it was just, a buck, yeah. no doubt. Yeah. I was like, son of a bitch. I was like, that deer was right there. Like mm -hmm. he, he was watching me. He heard me coming. And as soon as I turned my head, it wasn't like when I stood there and stopped and stared at him. It was as soon as I turned my head to walk away. Yeah. He was up and out of there. God, and I was they're incredible. They are. So it's like those are the spots that um you know it they say it, you know, like we all listen to Steve Shirk is he's the big buck big woods, you know, scouting Gandhi. guru. Yeah. <laughs> and when I when Dallas and I went with him and did that scouting trip, like that's exactly all the spots he took us to. He took us the, all the bucks that that year in 2020 that he was hunting. He took us to the spots to show us where those deer were living, and that was invaluable to see it because then I took it and brought it back home. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, like this is where these deer want to be. That doesn't make it easy to hunt them. Like Steve doesn't kill 160 inch bucks every year. He's on them, but he doesn't mm -hmm. kill them because it's really freaking hard. But finding yeah. them is is the biggest challenge, you know. What I thought was neat from last year's deer camp. Uh, with all the guys was when, when shots happened or when we had encounters, most of the time, it wasn't every time, but most of the time when you'd look on your topo map on your Garmin, we were right near one of those fingers mm -hmm. almost every time. And, and it was neat because Dallas, you know, had everybody strategically set up a lot of guys on those finger points as sitters and having guys pushing towards those. And uh, it's just, it was, it's neat to, finally have the the information and actually put it to to use in the field i mean we always these are all those things that we've always talked about but like to actually watch it live is is freaking awesome yeah yeah so that's that's what we've got to work on here um i was thinking about it tonight you know i was looking at my spreadsheet of who's committed and who i still got to wrangle up and mm -hmm. got a few guys that i still need to get confirmation from on whether they're coming or not but we uh you know probably Dallas and Brian and I are going to need to get together here in the next couple of weeks to start trying to put plans together. Like we, we, this year we really want to be organized to have, have the drives drawn out, have everybody know what the drives are going to look like before we do them mm -hmm. so that you, know, you can download the maps, you can look at them, you can understand where we're coming from and what we're going to be doing. Um, that's really going to be the game plan for this year is to try to give everybody the tools ahead of time. 
one of my top two favorite drives was the the last drive when we, that was a new area that we'd never been to. And the night prior, uh, after a handful of, of beers, Dallas just kind of like was scribbling numbers in different points on the map. And uh, <laughs> it was freaking awesome. It was awesome to watch him just kind of like, you know, just freely uh, map stuff out. But then to watch it like actually, you know, come together out there, it was, it was awesome. That was that, that area. I hope we, I hope we drive that again. Yeah, I I very badly want to go back to the area that you got lost. Um, yes. Not to bring up a sore subject, but that, that was my favorite. That was number that was number one on my list for sure. Yeah, I mean that that drive that hunt was freaking incredible, and I I want to go back in there so bad. Mm-hmm. So I think we'll probably end up spending. We might do day two again over there, but like spending an entire day doing that area, but have the morning and the afternoon planned out with with I like and this is I think for anybody who's listening to this discussion that hasn't done a hunt like this or wants to do something, it doesn't have to be to the scale with the number of people, but you know, have have plan B's set up. So like when a deer does get shot and you've got all these you got half a group of people. So like last year, you know, Chris shot that buck in the morning and it was close to the end of the drive, but nobody we had poor poor radio communication because of the hills and nobody really knew what the game plan was for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we had, and Dallas was not there and we were kind of relying on Dallas to put the plans together. So we were really pretty disjointed that afternoon and it wasted a good portion of the afternoon. Like we still put together a decent hunt, Mm -hmm. but it was, it was a mess. We were in in a prime area to just kind of blow the afternoon, you know, that was Right. That where you came and you came actually, uh, and you met me on that when I was sitting on that hillside. The views there, I felt like I could shoot for two hundred yards. It was like, oh, for sure. it, it yeah. was it was unbelievable. And there was and there was no acorns last year. Mm-hmm. So if you're telling me that there's acorns this year, um, you know, not that there will be in that area, but mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. There was no acorns last year, and the areas where you are and you're telling me there is this year. So I didn't think we were going to have a good drop because of the drought, but I'm telling you at least the areas I've been hunting, it's been unbelievable. Yeah. So, I mean, an area like that, like there was deer in there, but there was really not a lot of food. Mm -hmm. So if there's, if there's acorns, if there's mass crop, like I think those areas could be, they could be freaking money for sure. Definitely. But we'll, uh, so we'll be putting some game plans together for that. So we're ready to rock and roll here in a couple of weeks and mm-hmm. what's uh is your brother on going to come to this one or we gotta we gotta stay on him jim you gotta, gotta stay, on, stay him. on him. all right everybody that's I, listening to this or listens to this get jimmy harvey message him dm him get him to yep. come to this send big jim a message and tell him that he needs to be a man just <laughs> tell him to be a man that's all he'll know exactly what, what we're talking about yep <laughs> you gotta like it's i get it like they go up to the adirondacks every year and do their muzzle loader hunt and i never made that like it's just a weekend that won't work for me it's sarah's birthday weekend maybe once the kids are a little bit older it might be something that i i can you know take billy with me and that's your rut. that's your rut time (laughs) yeah right (laughs) yeah my my rut is on november 9th i i I will i will mark my territory on that day um so help me god um (laughs) wink wink so yeah it's i want big jim there with us pretty bad it's dad's mm-hmm. first trip to go do that with us so i would really love to have jimmy there too yep. so we'll keep working them yeah we'll it's the biggest them. adventure you could have in, in a drivable area you know a couple hour r- drive and boom you're in like this you know monster hillsides and and deep deep hollows it's just like uh you feel like you're in a different in a different world you know, you feel like you're yeah. out west. It's like a mini western hunt. You know, it's like kind of how I refer to it. It's neat. Yeah, and even when you come down into town, there, like it doesn't seem like you're in the mountains. But mm-hmm. then you get up, you get up there, and you get off the beaten path, and you get into those hills, and it's the valleys. You know, you're hunting everything from the top, and it's just mm-hmm. the hills are that much taller than what we have here. It's just that all of our access, typically in New York, is from the bottom, and you go mm-hmm. up. And down there, it's from the top, and you go down. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's interesting the difference there for sure. But I just like the adventure, and I like the uh, 
the, the unknown, you know, you don't know what monsters are hiding behind the next ridge, you know, it's just uh, there, a lot of these deer in that kind of terrain, you know, are, don't have the kind of pressures that they have in other places. And it's just like, you know, they can get old when they get old, they, you typically can get big. And then if the, the food sources are there and whatnot, they, you know, they could be healthy. It's, you know, there's not a, there's not a ton of monsters there, you know, just based off of what you guys have been killing, but there's good deer and there's a few that are just unbelievable. And it's the, it's like I said, it's the unknown. It's not like, you know, we're, we're hunting a farm where, where we might have a majority of the bucks on camera and kind of know it's like the yeah. unknown is cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really digging that. Like the, I don't know what it is about this season or this year in my life, but I'm like, I have totally toned back on a lot of my effort that I've been putting in with scouting it, just cause I don't have the time, mm -hmm. but it's just really make, it's actually making it really enjoyable because I'm going out and I'm just, I have yep. no reservations and the lake, especially last year, I, I got so frustrated because I had my trail cameras getting tampered with and people were stealing camera cards and, and it was, and it was like driving me nuts. And I was mm -hmm. worried about what was going on all the time. Whereas now I like, I don't have any cameras out other than on our private property and our two cutting link systems. Mm -hmm. And I, it's freaking sweet. Um, oh, sidebar. Danny boy sent me a picture this morning. Oh boy. Mega giant. Mega. Come on. Where's he? Mega. Boy. He's on the piece of property that Danny boy's got access to that. I cannot talk about where he shot a buck last year. Exactly. The same spot oh, where he shot a boy. Oh, and this boy. deer, this deer, he hasn't seen it. Uh, well, no, he had pictures of it last year. Um, but hadn't seen it since and thought that it was dead. And then got a first picture of it last night. Dude, the brow tines have got to be like eight or ten inches long. Um, the brow tines are as tall as the G2s, and this buck's got to be 18 or 20 inches wide. The picture's from the back. <laughs> he just looks freaking gigantic. Yeah, so, you, you got to send me one of those so I can drool over it later. Yeah. <laughs> Danny hasn't – he hasn't even – he hasn't even wet his whistle yet. So he'll be – you mark my words, that son of a bitch is going to go out there – for his first hunt and he's going to stick something and then he'll be like, all right, yeah, I'm just going to go back home and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and watch football and be a dad. That's yep. what Danny's going to do. I really like this approach that we all have. We're not all of us. It seems like we're not burning ourselves out. We're not pumping in all this, every little waking hour like we used to and obsessing over camera photos and whatnot. It's uh, it's, you're right. It's, it's a lot more enjoyable this way. Yeah. So I, I'm finding that so much of it is like ego driven, you know, like, you know, with me doing this stuff for the last few years of the podcast, like I was feeling like I had to be putting in all that extra time and effort. And if I didn't shoot some huge buck or if I didn't shoot, you know, I, I want to shoot six, seven deer again this year. Like that's the number I want to get to, but I really, this whole obsession with shooting big bucks. Like I want to shoot a big buck. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But like, I want to fill my freezer and uh, that's going to continue to be the, the theme of my, of my podcast and my life is like, we have to, we got to realize that not everyone's priorities are shooting giant bucks. And it's such a, it really is a very difficult thing to obtain and people that do it consistently, like they are very good hunters, but they also have very good property that mm -hmm. consistently produces mature deer and they can control that. And there's some people that, just continue to get it done every year on public and they're badasses, but I'll tell you, there's probably a hole in their life somewhere where they don't have a good relationship with their kids or their wife despises them. Mm -hmm. Their job is they don't do well at work because they're focusing on all this stuff that really doesn't matter. Yeah. So, I mean, that's been, my dad and I have had several long conversations, especially over the last few months where it's like, you know, what are the priorities in life? Like, I love doing this. I love the podcast. I love all the people I've met and the connections I've made, and I want to continue to do it. But, like, it cannot come between me and and my family and me and my work. Like, I have a job that I'm wicked passionate about, and I there's so much going on in my day-to-day -day life right now uh, with the the transition of, of, uh, of moving to electric, electric school buses is just an absolutely – insane proposition um on a large scale basis and it's taking so much of my time 
but I'm passionate about it because it's something that I can make a difference with in my, in my business and in the circles that I run, I can make mm-hmm. a difference by educating people and educating myself and, and helping implement this stuff. So it's like, you know, I don't, I don't have time to put together, you know, hours of content a week curated for, for stuff. It's like, it bums me out. Like I love doing that, but I don't have the time. So yeah, you, you find time every now and then, you know, if, if time like now, you know, you texted yeah. me out of nowhere and you, Hey, you want to hop on and do a little podcast? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I got time. You have time. So let's do it. But we're not, like you said, we're not uprooting our life for this stuff. This is our hobby. It's our passion, but like there are other passions that we have. So it's, it's been, it's been refreshing to balance everything nicely this year. Like I said, I, I it's going to be the first, hot weekend or not hot weekend, but it's be the first weekend in November. And I don't think I'm going to go into the deer woods. I think I'm just going to uh, hang out with my kid and uh, just have a nice family weekend or, you know, whatever. I'm going to figure out something, but I'm going to just enjoy myself and then just look forward to the, the following weekend and kind of keep an eye on the weather. And if uh, something, you know, a weather pattern changes or something, maybe it might hop in there, but I'm kind of pl- trying to play the game smarter than I ever have instead of just trying to, force things and like kind of muscle things you know i just i want to be more swift in my movements now you know yeah and i'll and like take someone like dallas you know dallas is a little bit further down the road you know he, dallas has got his youngest is in first grade or second grade so like he's finally starting to get some time back for himself mm-hmm. um but like in those years when his kids were super young like he did not like he basically stopped archery hunting. I don't think he archery hunted for five, six years, maybe if not longer. Mm-hmm. Um, he stopped archery hunting. He bought a crossbow, and he would he wouldn't start hunting until crossbow started, and just because he didn't have that much time. But then he was saving himself until it got into rifle season. It got to be later, you know, later in the season, and that's when he was killing all of his bucks. Was when. Dallas or Brian was tagged out. I was tagged out. Bob was tagged out. Like, and or or we were just burnt out. Like we didn't have the energy or the time to be able to get out there. And here's mm-hmm. Dallas. Like, oh, perfect weather night. It's thirty degrees and snowing, and I'm gonna go sit on the edge of the food plot. And out comes a buck that we've all been chasing the entire season. And Dallas waxing with a muzzle loader. Mm-hmm. You know, so like, there's a lot to be said for that. I think I'm trying to learn from some guys like him who you you walk into his garage and it's just absurd what he has done. He's all, he's not, he's 40 years old and he's got, I mean, his garage is full of beautiful bucks and it's like to this, just, to this day, the best hunters I know and the biggest buck killers I know aren't on social media. No one knows their name. Uh, yeah. They're not, they're not a, a hometown hero. Uh, they're just a guy that's passionate and they're smart and they use their skills the right way. Yeah. Um, you know, like that, the guy that the neighboring property to, to my dad's uh, farm, you know, it's two years in a row that he freaking capitalized and I'm could not be more happy to shake his hand and put my hands in that deer and just yeah. be, you know, I had him on camera and I would love to be the guy to say that I shot them, but he did it two years in a row. That doesn't just happen out of luck. You know, maybe one yeah. year, okay, hey, crossed your 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 property and, and not, you know, you got him first. No, this guy is doing his homework, clearly. Yeah, you know? yeah it's impressive. But it's again, really he's, a, he's a guy that's not on social media. He's not out there. Look, look what I could do. Look at the bucks I could kill and, like, all this kind of sort of thing. He's just, just playing his game, man. And I, I want to be more like that. In all aspects of life, yes. you know? Yep. Um, I, had, I had a buddy uh, – my good friend, Chris, uh, he was asking me, we were sitting at the Bills game the other day and, uh, Sarah went, um, she went to the Bills store. So she got up and it was just us boys sitting there mm-hmm. and, uh, it's, it was halftime and Chris is like, you know, so Chris hasn't hunted, um, probably in six years, six, seven years. He was like a diehard hunter, but he, his, uh, his family owned property, like right next to this house, his grandma owned the property and he, he would just, I mean, he was like obsessed. Like Chris has an obsessive personality. Like he gets into something, he is going to do it like all the time. So now Chris is back into archery. His father-in-law bought a piece of property that's freaking right up against Mendenpons Park. Mm -hmm. And it is mint. Like the deer population is absurd. There's big bucks all over the place. So he's like, he's in full rut right now. 
Mm-hmm. And so he's hunting like a lot. And he says to me, he goes, he goes like, how do you, like, how do you deal? Like, how do you get Sarah to be okay with you? Like hunting during, like, how do you do it? I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't, I don't hunt that much. I don't feel, but I, I also try to, it's not easy. Like it's, there is, there is frustration. There is exhaustion. There is mm-hmm. uh, a level of pressure that it puts on your spouse when you're going to say like, I'm going to go to camp for the weekend. Um, and, but I think the biggest piece is like just trying to plan it out. Like don't drop it on them. Don't uh, surprise them with that. So the other, you know, when you, it's a lot different if you're somebody that hunts the back 40 behind your house or the farm down the road and you're home every night. Yeah. But if you're that guy who has a hunting camp and you know, you're a, you're a first time dad and your kid's gotten to be one year old and is now moving and grooving and it, it wears you the hell out. Like you say, okay, Friday night I'm gone and I'm going to be gone until Sunday night for eight weekends in a row. Like, mm-hmm you might want to get prepared to get served some paperwork. Like that's a rough (laughs) situation to put your spouse in. Yeah. But like, how do you, how do you handle that? Uh, Um, So she already knows like from, you know, when we first started dating that this time of year, October, November, December, or like, that's like my time. I wait all year for it. Um, But now having a child, you know, that kind of changed that changed things quite a bit. And I make sure that she has more than enough notice with the weekends, I, I try to plan out on a calendar with her what weekends that I'm targeting. And I said, and she understands that like with weather and different things that might happen and come up that, you know, those might shift a little bit, but I give her something on paper that she could like kind of plan her mentally uh, prepare herself to know that she's going to have the kid by herself for a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's, that's been huge. And then if things change, I try to give her as much notice as possible, but, you know, she's also been pretty understanding of like something happens at a, at a drop of a hat. If I start getting more daytime pictures of one of those big guys, I'm going to be like, Hey, I'm heading up there. I'm going to spend two days, you know? And you know, when I'm not there, when I'm not hunting and when I'm not, uh, you know, game planning, I'm putting all my time in with the family. I'm doing my honey do lists. I, whatever you want to do, honey, you don't want to go out to eat or whatever. Do you want to take the kid to the park? you know, and make sure that you enjoy and soak up every ounce of those because it's not only important for for her and for for the kid, it's important for you guys to, you know, uh, not lose that quality time. So I think that, and they see that, and they see you as a father, you know, uh, balancing everything, and they know how passionate and how much you love this, this sport, but yet you're taking the time to be a good dad and a good husband, and they see that from the sidelines. So, you know, uh, the percep, perce- like one of my old baseball coaches used to say, like, you know, perception is everything, you know? So like, you never know who's watching. Could be scouts, could be whoever, could be your wife. <laughs> so like whenever you're doing something, you know, do it and, and do it. So that way, you know, they, they can appreciate it. Yeah. That's so you're saying, of- so you're saying deceive your spouse is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's right. And, uh, you know, you gotta, I've said this on the podcast before too, you know, when Sarah hit me with this, like back in 2020, when Kate was born, you know, and it went from one on one, two on one to one on one Mm -hmm. situation, you know, and she, we used to have our phones out all the time. We used to take tons of pictures and post and stuff on social media. Like, you know, you know, and if one of us sees the other doing it, we're like, Hey, what are you doing over there? Is it that important? Yeah. You know, and it sucks because, like, a lot of times you want to, like, look, oh, my mom or dad texts me. I want to talk to my parents. Like, yeah, that's fine. But, you know, the the diddle farting around and you got to be engaged when you're at home. And, uh, you know, so that gives you the opportunity. Like, you know, I'll probably um, I was having this exact conversation with my dad yesterday. And, you know, it's going to come down to it. Like, I'll probably I'll get I went. it's my Halloween weekend. I was gone. And then I'll be, I'll go up to camp for the gun opener. So I'll be up there, you know, Friday, Saturday, and I'll come home uh, Sunday. And then probably the only other full weekend I'll do gone is going to be Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So it's three weekends out of the whole fall and they're, they're planned dates. They're times that she knows I'm going to be gone. And then I've really become accustomed to just doing evening sits. 
And, you know, I've got the property close to the house here that I can, I can do my evening hunts. And on the weekends, I want to let her sleep in. That's the one thing she likes to do is sleep in till eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock. And that's the only days that she can do it. So, you know, I'm not, I'd rather wake up and have my coffee and go to the gym and do what I got to do and come home. And then I'm with the kids until eight thirty, nine o'clock while she's sleeping and giving her a break and chance to recharge the batteries. And then I'll go hunt in the evening. Mm-hmm. And uh, that seems to work out really well for us. I think that's, that's a good tip for any of you dads out there is let your wives sleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It'll be good for you. But yeah, you do. It sounds like you do the same things that I do. Like where you put things on a calendar way in advance, you pick out those target weekends that she knows will be gone for a while. And if you could sprinkle some hunts in between that, great. It's like I see on the cake. Yeah. Part in here. So did you have anything, anything else, anything grinding your gears you wanted to? Grinding my gears. Well, the whole, like I told you early on this year, uh, the whole squirrel hunting in Pennsylvania during archery season is preposterous. You know, you got guys out there shooting shotguns up into the trees wearing orange when you got guys out there in full camo, no orange required. It's yeah. just like, it's ridiculous. I had a couple of buddies that had some crazy encounters with, with hunters and, and, you know, hearing BBs flying past them through the trees. It's like, it's wild. That they even, yeah, that they even do yeah, that. that's not good. Yeah, oh. and we I mean, we have the same thing here. We have we have squirrel season. Um, you got turkey season. Um, we have a fall turkey season. Um, you know, you've got bear season. Uh, well, that's the North Country, so that doesn't that's mm-hmm. different. But and even I mean, if we even you go out to Colorado, like you have archery, deer and elk going on, while you also have muzzleloader deer and elk going on Mm -hmm. and like it doesn't make a lot of sense like i feel like if you're if you're going to have a firearm season going you should it should be required for everyone to wear orange for safety purposes i i I mean that was a huge discussion point here in new york last year was the whole the state made it uh a law that you had to wear orange i have no issue with that like i'm not trying to get shot and Mm -hmm. i think you know not everybody is experienced not everybody is well trained and mentored on how to handle yourself in the woods. So, you know, wear orange. Don't you? By the time the deer see you, they're either going to smell you or those they should be dead because you shot them. <laughs> so, right. you know, don't don't worry about. Or, ooh, I got something that grinds my gears. Go ahead. So I, uh, I'm sitting out here uh, this evening. Sarah brings out the laundry basket to. Uh, to show me what she found when she was switching the laundry out. Mm -hmm. And when I, this isn't really grinding gears, but it kind of is because my gears are pretty ground on it is I, over the weekend I was using, I've been using face paint. And when I got home, I was so skeeved out about ticks uh, because I had a bunch of ticks on me up at camp on Saturday Mm -hmm. that I had all my, all my outer layer hunting gear off and in a bag and ready to throw into the laundry immediately to get everything clean and uh washed my face paint and ran it through the dryer with all of my new origin camo and my four low stuff oh no way so so we re- we put it through the wash again um most of it came out of the out of my origin stuff but my four low my green four low pants are oh, like well, they're just, dude, they're, like, covered in just random paint. Like, they've got green, brown, and... and uh, That's perfect. And, it's got the... It's a personalized camo. It is now, yes. So, um, I had to laugh. It's... it's You just have to laugh at this shit. But mm-hmm. um, that grinds my gears is to ruin my expensive camouflage, or at least ruin the appearance of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that grinds my gears is ticks. I fucking hate them. And I hope they all rot and burn and die in hell. Mm-hmm. I really, so I came home on Sunday morning. Like I said, I had some on me on Saturday and I came home Sunday morning and, uh, go to jump in the shower. And I sit down in the old pot to take the Browns of Super Bowl and, uh, look down at my macacus region. And there's a tick burrowed right into the inner thigh of my leg. Jesus. Yep. So I, so I, uh, I figured it had to have, it had to have happened Saturday night because I changed my clothes in the cabin and did a, did a, a baby wipe shower. And I did not remember feeling or seeing anything in that region. So there's a, there's a tremendous uh, tick repellent. That's nonsense 
and it works awesome. It's in a yellow bottle. I'll have to send you a picture of the bottle. Um, I okay. got it off. Of, I watched it, was watching the hunting public one time and they did like an in-depth study. They had one of the guys went out in like a Tyvek suit and sprayed himself <laughs> down with this stuff and laid down like a, in a tick and what they knew was a tick infested area <laughs> and had ticks crawl all over him. And you could see them just dying and falling off from the spray. Really? It was actually, yeah. So I was like, I'm a believer. And if these guys are spraying it and they say, and it's scent free, I'm in. And it's true. When you open the bottle and give it a whiff, like even with your nose close, it's like the tiniest little bit of odor. But other than hmm. that, it's like it's it's pretty pretty awesome stuff. So I'm like I'm hardcore about avoiding ticks because I've had families with that have uh, gotten Lyme disease and stuff over the years, and like I am not trying to get that. So I, yeah. uh, I spray up pretty heavily before I head out, especially this time of year. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's weird how spotty it is. Like out here, we have not had many. Like my my deer had one tick on it, and. Mm -hmm. it, there was nothing. And I mean, walking around in the brush and stuff, I didn't have any ticks on me. I haven't in months. Um, and I first time up at, up at camp and it was just like, just walking through the woods, I've got ticks on me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I ended up, so I ended up using one of the tick remover tools while Sarah did. And, um, she got it, ended up breaking the head off, unfortunately. Of the, um, of the tick. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, <laughs> no, right. Jim. Yeah. Right. It was pretty funny because so so here I am. I get home from camp and uh, haven't showered in two days, and uh, you know <laughs> you she gotta spread them. <laughs> <laughs> she takes Anita to work on the tick, and and she goes, "It smells like balls down here." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes, yes, it does, hun. And the kids are like, "No, is Dad gonna be all right?" <laughs> uh -huh. Um. But uh, so we got the tick out, uh, and unfortunately the head stayed in. But we, I'm gonna, I'll probably send it out to get it tested just to make sure. But I, I called the doctor, and they sent me the the prescription. So, um, it's yeah. an anim, it's I don't know if it's antibiotic or what it is, but it's a two pill one at one day deal where you just take these two pills, and uh, it's supposed to if you catch it early enough, it'll it'll knock it down if there's any chance of you having an infection, but it's uh it's something that happens and it's something to know what to do if it does happen because even if you prepare yourself there's a chance that you still could get one so i always try to religiously check myself after i come out of the woods and i try to take a shower when i can um and just check like all those areas where you know your your, your socks your sleeves um areas where your um where your skin you know where where you have edges, I guess, um, mm -hmm. and around your hairlines and stuff is where I tend to find them. Um, but yeah, ticks that it grinds my gears. <laughs> so one more thing that grinds my gears is is the state police doing a DWI check uh, just down the road from the stadium that put me in a in a traffic jam. I was sober. I had one beer in the tailgate before we went in the game, so I was good mm -hmm. to go. But they set up this, uh, they set up a, a DWI checkpoint, you know, obviously one way in, one way out. So they could tell if anybody was trying to bail. Sure. And, but it freaking, you know, it's, it's almost one o'clock in the morning on after Sunday night football. And, you know, we're stuck on Southwestern Boulevard coming out of, coming out of Orchard Park into West Seneca, we're stuck there for half an hour, 45 minutes as we're just crawling through traffic. And it's like we should have been home in thirty minutes, not uh, not an hour and a half. So yeah, crazy. That grinds my gears. Yeah. Hey, heck of a game though. Woo! <laughs> it was. Uh, we're spoiled rotten. Our football team is really good, and uh, even when they don't play that well, they still kind of dominate. It's pretty amazing. Josh Allen's incredible. I love watching like the the memes and the gifs and stuff and all the little TikToks. Uh, after like the games and stuff when he plays well of, of, you know, him being a superhero and like all these different, you know, you see, you've seen him. And, oh, that's uh, great. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. It's awesome. Bill's fans are the best in the world. Yeah. It's fun time right now. I hope we, uh, I hope we can put it all together this year. Yeah. Pretty awesome. I seen one, uh, I seen a, a meme somebody made the other day. It was like a, it showed like a, a random city just like up in flames. And it said, if the Eagles and Bills were to play in a Super Bowl like 2022, <laughs> and that's so true there would be yeah. like it would just be a rioting of like 
uh, it'd be a positive riot, but it would be rioting nonetheless. It would just be, it'd be unbelievable. I don't know if riot's a good word we should use anymore for that. It would be, uh, it would be like a festival, you know? Yeah, true. A festival. Very, you know, riots just have, you know, they just, they remind you of bad things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true. Bad choice of words, Jim. It's just, words matter, Jim, okay? So just, you gotta remember how you say these things. Because now this, this discussion will probably get flagged because there's disinformation about riots or something. Yeah. All right. That's how that'll go. Uh, do you have anything else for the wonderful people of the Purdue no. Outdoor? I mean, we covered a lot of different random topics, but if I had to, to summarize everything for the, all the guys that are looking to finish their season would be to pick and choose your battles uh, wisely. Don't burn yourself out and uh, feed them. Feed them. We had a very similar podcast about a year ago. I, I would think it was right around, probably right now, the first week in November, and it was, it was titled The Best is Yet to Come mm-hmm. because I was very frustrated. I didn't shoot a single deer or have a shot opportunity with my bow last year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough game. So yeah. don't get down if you haven't had your shot yet. It could happen at any moment. So yeah. keep your head up and, you know, go deer hunting in your bikini. Cause it's going to be 70 degrees. I just make sure you wear sunscreen. <laughs> so that, that's awkward. Okay. Yeah. Well, if, <laughs> I guess you would just wear a speedo, Jim. That's fine. You can just wear a speedo. Yeah. I could yeah. see the ticks that within my inner thigh easier that way. Yeah. yeah. You could, you could spot them before they get into you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, big guy. Thanks for jumping out with me. Fun chatting with you and uh, everybody out there. Go out and feed them because they're trying to breed them. (laughs) Breed them radio. (laughs) Thanks, Billy. Catch you later, bud. See ya.